see Mr. Kane back. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking this morning about um, it's a bit overcast with uh, smoke. And it made me think about that sometimes it seems like uh, in our experience in life, you know, we may um, desire to trust all into his care and know that he loves us, but sometimes it can seem like he's clouded from our vision. But just like today with the smoke, we know that the sun is out, right? The sun is there. And so we can know that even in um, times of seeming waiting, where we don't hear God's voice, um, we have to trust and know that he's there. And um, anyway, that's uh, something that came to me today as I was thinking about uh, the smoke kind of early this year. But um, we have a, a really great uh, program for you. I'm very excited to hear about uh, Chris Van Allen's experience. And um, we uh, are going to have our prayer and um, scripture reading at this time, or scripture reading first and then prayer. Good morning. I'm going to read from chapter Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherein shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot, uh, the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but, as a, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine there before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Shall we kneel for prayer as far as possible? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, this morning, to praise you and bring honor and glory to your name. Bless us here that are here. Bless those that are watching online. Send your spirit into this house and into our hearts and fill us with your love, your wisdom, and spiritual understanding. We pray for your angels to surround us today and protect us against the temptations of Satan and his demons. You've promised us in 1 John 1, 9, that if we are faithful and just, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We claim that promise today, Lord. Search our hearts and our thoughts, and if there is any wickedness or any sin that we have, please forgive us and lead us into your righteousness. Amen. Every power that God has given us should be employed in the very wisest and highest service to God. The Lord has brought out a people from the world to fit them, not only for a pure and holy heaven, but to prepare them through the wisdom he shall give them to be co-laborers with God and preparing the people to stand in the day of God. Our mission uh, feature today is brought from the country of Honduras, the nation of Honduras. And um, back in 2012, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Honduras. And um, we went, this is, uh, this is the mission we went to. Um, 
It's Vita Mission, which under Vita Mission is IBC, International Bible College, and also um, Casablanca, which is, a, which is a school they started, which is kindergarten. Um, we went to visit my daughter in El Suato, Honduras, which is two hours north of Tegucigalpa. Tegucigalpa is a city and the capital of the Republic of Honduras. It is located on hilly terrain hemmed in by mountains at an elevation of 3,200 feet above sea level. Flying in there is a very challenge for a lot of people. If you've never been to Honduras and you have to fly into Tusagapa and you gotta fly in through the mountains and the plane comes in at a right angle with the wings tipped and when we landed, everybody on the plane clapped because there's been many accidents there at that airport. Honduras is in Central America. It's the second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. This is an aerial shot overlooking the campus Honduras of uh, Vita Mission. And um, let me go over here. This is my daughter. She went down there. She raised her own money through selling mega books. And she was there for two and a half years. Um, and it's a medical missionary and evangelistic Bible a teaching school. She learned um, the language uh, well enough to give Bible studies and do medical missionary work. Uh, back up to this other picture. The, fe the young fellow there is Josue. Um, Josue, um, and that's his father right there with him. Um, Josue Mario Suazo Franco. He had never heard of the Se of Seventh Day Adventists until he was 15 years old. And his mother and dad were evangelicals. His aunt was an evangelical preacher. There was um, Laurel Brook Academy from Tennessee, self-supporting school, was going down to Honduras, and their place to stay they couldn't stay. So, through channels, they asked. Josue's aunt to host them and she says you know she says she was scared she said she had heard of the admins that they had a health message they didn't eat meat they did you know and so she was really nervous on how to feed them and how to take care of them but finally she gave in she decided to uh, take care of to host the school the students that came down there for a mission trip and evangelism she was very impressed she was very impressed how they conducted themselves how they how they were very polite, very kind, to where she was so impressed that she decided to send her daughter to Laurel Brook Academy. She came over to Josue's house and started talking. He'd never heard of Adventists before, and he says, oh man, this is, they're weird, you know. They, they're, and so finally convinced him to apply to Laurel Brook Academy. The first year he was rejected, because it, it turned down because it was totally full. And they had been reading emails, and through the emails they sent him, said that we have an opening, which was the second year. And he fought it. He fought it. He didn't want to go. But he finally went. His mother told him not to argue with the people there or, or just go there and mingle in. And instead he did start to argue with some of the, some of the kids and some of the people about the Sabbath to where the dean finally confronted him and said, would you like to study the Bible and study the truth? So they studied. Josue gave his heart to the Lord at 15, 15, 16 years old and was baptized. When he was baptized, after he was baptized, he accepted the Seventh-day Adventist truth. He called his mother and his dad, and they cried. And, they, and then they said, you know, the Lord has put you there for some reason. Learn as much as you can. They were supportive of him, even though they were still evangelicals. Then he was um, decided, he heard about a, um, um, the school in Norway, which was, um, which was the uh, um, 
It was a European Bible school, which was in Norway, and he decided to go over there. And he studied over in the European Bible school in Norway, and then he came home, and he talked to his parents, and he says, you know, I want to start a school here just and mirror image the European Bible school in Norway. I want to start it here in Honduras. Well, his dad had said, you know, I have two hours from here. I have that guava farm. And I, he says, I'll donate it to you. He says, um, I'm not using it. I just go up there. It's two hours northeast of Tegucigalpa. And, and in a little town of, of El Suato, which is a town of 3,000 people, no Adventist presence at all. And there's a Catholic church there. And so it had one building where they dried coffee. It had the guava orchard and tamarind. So he went up there and started this school. When we got there, there was there. This is the building. The that far end on your on your right was it was the kitchen, and then they had storage. And then they had, on the left, they had a room. Well, my wife and I went, Jeannie and I went, we, we ended up staying in this one room. Um, you know, they, um, now this is what it looks like. They've re changed that building, they've added onto it, redid the whole kitchen, they put in classrooms up above because the school, um, teaches everything from spirit of prophecy in the Bible. They teach Bible workers and, event and uh, medical missionary from all over the world. It's a bilingual school. Um, they have classrooms, they have lifestyle center. And um, so this is what it looks like now. And before we were there, this was the kitchen that we, that my wife helped with working in that little kitchen. You had to prepare everything. Everything you prepared that day, you had to eat because there was no refrigeration. There was no power, not even so solar power. It, it, was, it was all, you know, when it got dark, the lights went out and you had candles and they had gravity fed tank. And since then they've built a new water tower. They've gotten some, a lot of help and a lot of donations. This was the storage. So every week they had to go down to Tegucigalpa and get their supplies. When they picked us up at the airport, my wife and I rode in the back of a Toyota crew cab pickup, crammed with all of us, it rained on the way, we had to cover ourselves with a tarp, and we just stopped at multiple places. So they picked us up in the morning, by the time we got there it was dark because of, it was a two hour trip, plus they had to stop everywhere and get supplies. This was the kitchen, uh, the area where we ate. All the dishes had to be done outside now they have this new kitchen. It it's, works a lot better for their people. And um, this was the room that my wife and I stayed in. At the end, we didn't realize it, but we didn't really have a mattress. We just were on springs. And there was mice and rats that got into there every night, and the cats were fighting, and we kicked the cats out because they were fighting over the rats, killing the rats. This was our clothes hanger, our closet, <laughs> separated our, and our dryer to dry the clothes. So the school does evangelism throughout the different towns, and this was one of their setups that they did evangelism. They go to different areas and do evangelism. They do uh, uh, medical missionary work. Uh, they do hydrotherapy. They have gardens and orchards there. This was, this was the church. Um, when I was down there, I was at, they asked me to speak. They were doing a series on, on Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, and um, so it had a translator, which I was used to. I had, when I was in Thailand, we had a translator. But this was a church. It was just, it was just a small little build, building in the town with a dirt floor, so when you knelt down, yeah, you got your pants dirty, and it, but they worshiped, and you know, they had a service every, you know, Thursday night, and the town people, there was nothing they could want, they just, the whole 
road was filled with people outside listening to the service. And because, um, you know, they had a great presence there in the, in, the, in the town. They were doing a good work. This is a new church that they have started to build. They've got most of it built now in the town, which is a really blessing. Um, right across, they built it right across from the Catholic Church. And uh, they're, doing, they're doing a fabulous work with meeting the needs of the people. Um, this is area where they baptize the people. What they did was they started reaching the people with the school. They, um, they started a kindergarten class and they reached the parents through the children. And then they graduated from kindergarten to first grade and on up. Right now they have 180 some, 89 or 200 students, K through 12. And when we were there, they had built one small part of the school. And since then, they have built the whole school. And they're, they're just, they have ended up bringing the, have, they've had a lot of baptisms through bringing the people through the school. Um, you know, Honduras is a very poor country. It is riddled with a lot of difficulties. Albert Einstein said, in the middle of crisis, there arises great opportunities. The way, reason why we are not growing is because we don't have the crisis going. We don't see the need. We don't have the crisis in our life. Whenever there's a crisis, things will flourish. You know, the crisis is coming. The Lord's coming soon. Um, ministry is not a job or a Sabbath routine. It is a privilege to be chosen and used by Jesus. This is one of their sayings. So if you want to see more of this, you can go on Facebook. They have uh, Vita Mission. Um, they have also you can go to YouTube and see more detailed Josue's um, uh, testimony. So it was a privilege that we got to go down there. I stay in touch with them. They're, they're doing an awesome work down there. And... Um, it was started by young people. Young people very energetic and wanting to spread the word of God and reach the people of Honduras. And it's something I didn't know, but Honduras is the largest, um, has the most Adventists, and that, and that division has the most Adventists of any division within the world. They have, they have over... Um, I forget the exact amount, but, you know, Josue said he had never heard of Adventists, but then he's, when he came back, he started looking, and there was like 68 churches within Tegucigalpa, within Honduras, within that area. But he said he'd never heard of them, never seen, never been, uh, no one ever came to him. So, you know, even though there could be a big presence, we, there's a lot of people that are in need of, of and want, having the desire to know the truth. So it is, our, it is our privilege that God has given us the opportunity to share this truth with others. At this time, we'll separate for our classes. Adult Sabbath School class will be over here, and I believe Joel is the facilitator, and then um, the children's classes are upstairs. All right, let's try that. Oh, that sounds a little better. Good morning and happy Sabbath. All right, let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to study your word today, and please bless us 
Um, may the words we speak help enlighten our own minds, but also the minds of those around us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have really been enjoying the Sabbath school quarterly. However, it is very, I feel like it's very challenging to teach this one. For some reason, it just feels a little more challenging to me. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about it. So as usual, I'm using the talking points uh, outline. So we're going to mix things up a little bit. So we're going to go Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday is what we're going to start with, which would be the great controversy centers on what? On what? Worship, all right? What is, worship's kind of an interesting word. Uh, I don't have a definition for it, but what is, what is the essence of worship? What's worship about? Well, I hope you all are here to worship God today, so come on, give me some feedback. What's worship about? giving honor to God, okay? Um, could we use the word loyalty? If you're worshiping God, you're being loyal to God, right? And uh, somebody made the analogy of, um, you know, in a, in a marriage, if there's no loyalty, the marriage isn't really going to last very long, is it? No. Uh, Buck, Bob's got his hand up. Bob, it's good to see you back. You're supposed to wait for the mic, Bob. <laughs> I'm getting there. I didn't get my exercise this morning. So that was <laughs> well, you said that worship was, was worshiping God, but a whole lot of people worship, and they don't worship God. Yes. They worship stuff. Yes. They worship ev everything under the sun. Any day, whether it's, I mean, it could be snowboarding. It could be skiing. It could be... Which they're but loyal to whatever they're, they're to worshiping, that. right? That is what their their whole uh, life is surrounded with, and what they what they put themselves into whole hog. You know what I mean? And, so, and that's what we need to do with God if we are going to be a Christian. Exactly. So, why is God worthy of worship? Why why do we worship Him? Tom's got his hand up right behind you, Bob. Because He's our Creator. Because He's our Creator. Isn't that an interesting point? Let's, um... One other quick thought. Yes, uh, but before you give your quick thought, everybody on this side go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. And everybody on this side go to Revelation 15, verse 4. So 4, Revelation 4, 11, and then Revelation 15, verse 4. Go ahead, Tom. No, I was just thinking when you think of worship, especially through the Old and the New Testament, when it tells us that we're to worship God, it's always predicated around the seventh-day Sabbath. Yes. That's why we worship him. We're, worship and the Sabbath are very tied together. Somebody who has Revelation 4.11, raise your hand and we'll give you a mic. Yeah. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things. And by your, and you, if I can read this here, and by you we will exist and were created. And who was saying that? The four and twenty elders. No, yeah. excuse me. Uh, yeah, the four and twenty elders. They fell down and told him that. Right. So the elders in heaven fell down and worshipped God and said, "You're worthy because you're our creator." So the point is, is that even the unfallen worship God because He's the creator. They didn't say, oh, because you're the savior of the world. They pointed out that God is the creator. Lenita. Elders in the New Testament, well, particularly in Revelation, always only refers to humans. And we don't know exactly who these elders were. Mm -hmm. But many believe that these 24 elders were some of those who were raised as the first fruits when Christ was resurrected. Yes, interesting point. Okay. But, but that can't be. Okay. I need, to, I need to correct on that because Revelation 4 is before Jesus ascended to heaven. And they ascended to heaven 
with him those who were raised. So the 24 elders, chapter 4 is talking about God. Jesus isn't even on the scene until Revelation 5. So that will be an interesting topic for further study. Um, Can somebody read uh, Revelation 15, verse 4, and then we'll give the mic to Lloyd. Or maybe we should get Lloyd to give his comment first. Robin, we'll do 15, verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So this one is saying that all nations, so this is more towards the judgment, so everybody eventually is going to say that God is worthy of worship, and did they, and why did they say he was worthy of worship? Because he's holy. Because he's the creator. Is the creator creation is the creator mentioned in that verse? No, not in that one. Okay. What is what is in that verse? It says that your judgments are made manifest. For his, so his ways of doing things are open to men, and because as we see how the, who the Lord is, how he does things, then we will love him and worship him. Yes. Yes, so when we see how God uh, works, then we will worship him. And if you backed up to verse 3, it says, Great and marvelous are your works. And part of his works is creation. So, So it all is sort of referring to that. Lloyd, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Great and marvelous are thy works, certainly. And... The epitome of how great his works are is is described on page 58, where that uh, uh, leper, uh, pistol star could hold millions of our sun. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, that, that one just blows me away. I think of... Um, You've all probably seen some picture of someone walking in a desert, and it's like completely flat, and the sun is shining, and it's, you know, kind of red looking, and there's heat waves coming up, and it's flat as far as you can see. Now, I'm going to make some, I'm going to say something that's technically not correct, but just picture it in your mind, because we know that the sun has like volcanoes on it and all sorts of weird things going on. There's eruptions. If you, have you seen, you know, when we see the, the um, northern lights, that's because there was a big eruption on the sun that shoots matter, you know, at Earth, basically. But imagine that star is so big, you can fit a million of our suns. How far would you be walking flat? Forever, it would seem to us. Forever. I like that. Thanks for bringing that up, Lloyd. Um, Let's look at a number of different verses. Somebody look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And somebody go to Exodus chapter 20, 8 to 11. And Karen, could you go to... um, Luke chapter 4. Lanita, could I send you to Luke chapter 6? And uh, Bob, could you do Isaiah 66? Okay, so we had Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 66. Who has, so I'm going to read them all off again. We have Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and then Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, and Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and then Lenita, I think it was Luke chapter 6, verse 5, and then Bob, I think I gave you Isaiah 66, 22, and 23. All right, whoever has Genesis chapter 2, raise your hand. Bonnie has it. (coughs) 
Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in that he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, and in the day of the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So there's only three verses there, right? But those three verses are pretty all-encompassing of this is what God did, and then he rested. This is what God did, and then he stopped. This is what God did, and he rested, right? Mm -hmm. So the Sabbath is set up right there in the second book of the Bible as this is what God did, and then he rested, right? So then who has Exodus chapter 20, verses... 8 to 11. Was God tired? That's a great question. Was Not hardly. I love that answer, Bob. God was setting up how a, a day, especially set apart for worship, a day where we focus on, my favorite word now, loyalty, right? Uh, who has Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11? You do? Okay. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. So God gives specific instructions in the Ten Commandments. God said, if you follow these Ten Commandments, you'll be worshiping me, honoring me, being loyal to me. And in there, he thought it was important enough to talk about the Sabbath. That kind of indicates God really thought it was kind of important. I mean, he only came up with ten things you have to do, right? It's only ten. That's not very many. All right, who had um, Luke chapter 4, verse 16? Karen does. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as, he, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, Day, and stood up for to read. So we there we see that, so so far we've seen right at the end of creation, God said, we're going to keep Sabbath. I rested. God uh, rested from his labors and set it up as a memorial of creation. Then at the Ten Commandments, he refers back to the Sabbath. And then we see all those centuries later, Jesus is still keeping the Sabbath, Right? as his custom was. So this wasn't a one-off, Jesus decided to make a special, it was Easter, and so he decided to go to church. No, it says Jesus did this on a regular basis. Lenita, did you have the next one, I think? Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 5. I will read the verse, and then I have a comment about God being tired. Yes. And he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And when you were talking about, well, the question came up about, um, was God tired? Um, I, clearly, that's, I like Bob's answer, too. No. <laughs> but think about when you do something creative. When you're finished, what do you do? You stop and admire it. You stop it. and admire it. Exactly. You stop and enjoy it. You rest and enjoy what you have created. And if we do that at our <laughs> insignificant scale, imagine what God must have felt as he viewed this beautiful creation that he'd made out of his mind. What a marvelous thought. And we get to enjoy that too. Amen. And he also set it up so that we could do this every week. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I get mics sometimes. So we, we kind of get a picture for what God's intent was for the Sabbath, right? So he's going to step back, but he creates man, male and female, in his own image, right? This is a very intimate relationship. Mm. And so he wants to spend not just time, he wants to teach them because they are not God. They're holy beings, but they're not God. How to take time and spend time with their creator. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, it says, And he said unto them, and so this is Christ speaking now, The Sabbath was made for man, mm. not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man, which Christ is called, is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So he not only originated it, He's the ruler of it. He says, I still want you to keep this the way it was intended. And in Christ's day when he walked the earth, it had become very perverted. Yes, yes. Um, Ing, did you have your hand up? So last night we were kind of discussing this a little bit. Um, I don't know if anybody has compared like different um, planets, stars, suns. And when you look at our earth compared to the size of the sun, the earth is like a speck. Well, when you compare the sun to some of the, you know, giant stars, some of the, you know, red giants, blue giants, the sun becomes this little speck. And it just, you know, when you think about how God just spoke that, and we don't even have any idea of how big the universe is. Yeah. But the earth is like even, sm because remember the sun was a speck. So the earth is even a smaller speck and we're on it somewhere. Yes. <laughs> we're on it somewhere. So that just kind of puts things in perspective. When you, when you climb into an airplane and you fly for 14 hours before you get off again, at like however fast that is, five, 600 miles an hour, you realize the earth is a really big place. <laughs> really big uh, place compared to us. Okay, Bob, did you have Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23? Yeah, you'd, I thought you'd said 22, and I go, no, no, I'm going to read both anyway, <laughs> because one hinges on the other. Yes. Before I say anything, I'll read this. I, I wanted to say that it's, it's really concerning to me, disconcerting, I should say, that man in many cases calls sunday the sabbath mm. i it's uh, i mean i'll be listening to an audiobook and they'll or something and they'll talk about the sabbath like oh wow they're but no no it's sunday and and in 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 france i don't know if in europe overall they do but in france they've completely changed the the calendar to make sunday the seventh day mm. and uh, i mean that's been for a long time anyway um, verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come and worship before me, saith the Lord. So here we find that the Sabbath is being referred to as something that we're going to continue doing. Right? Right? Um, so, we've talked about worship. Um, interestingly, I reading, was reading through Daniel, and you get to, uh, you know, Second Daniel, and you're talking about the image, and then right after the image, what's the next story? Okay, but after the dream, after the dream of the image, Yeah, it's worshiping the image, so it's about the three worthies going into the furnace. What's that story all about? The story's all about worship. And so it, you think, oh, I really want to read Daniel for the prophecy. Right in the middle, there's two stories, actually. That's the first one. That's the first story on worship. Three, you're right, because the first one's about worship and how do we treat our what God gave us, our temple. The second one's how do we worship? Do we, do we worship images? And the third one's who do we worship, right? 
Lenny, I can't stand it. She has to raise her hand. <laughs> Get her a microphone. <laughs> Actually, they're all about worship, if you yes. start thinking about it. Because yes. in Daniel 4 is the experience that Nebuchadnezzar had, and it wasn't until he, he was worshiping himself and all that I have done, he yes. says. And then he uh, is cut down for seven years, and then when he acknowledges God as a creator and worships him, he becomes sane again. And in Daniel um, 5, it's desecration of worship. Daniel 6 is where Daniel worships his God and then is thrown into the lion's den, and God protects him like he did the three worthies in the furnace. It's all about worship when you stop and think about it. Yes. Yes, that's really, I never, I thought, I'd started going that direction, Lenita. That's a really good point. Uh, moving along. Um, Joel? Yes. Okay, before you say something, Buck, why doesn't everybody, did, were we at Revelation 14, verse 7? Let's go, everybody go there, and then Buck can uh, give us your comment, Buck. Well, before we leave Daniel, Oh, yes. I always th I thought of one, one of the other stories, and it's not just you know who we worship, what we worship, but for Daniel, it was how he worshipped. It didn't just worship by himself in a dark. I mean, we says to go in our prayer closet. He wasn't just in a in a closed off space. He had a certain way. He faced a certain direction. He had the windows open. Mm -hmm. So when the decree came that you're not to worship anyone. But the king, he didn't close his windows, mm -hmm. right? He didn't change the way in which he honored or was loyal to the Lord. Yes. Uh, Revelation 14, 7. Someone raise your hand if you've got that. Gene has it. Yes. Saying with, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So it's, it's referring back to the fact of worshiping God is key to all of this. Fear God, give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment has come. There's, uh, remind me to talk, remind me about Daniel again when we get towards the end of our study, because there was something really interesting that I heard that I'd like to talk about. So uh, let's talk about evolution for a second, which was on Tuesday's lesson. So what does evolution do to a thought of the judgment or the Sabbath? What happens to the Sabbath and the judgment when, if we were to accept that we were evolved beings? Doesn't exist. Why? Because there was no creation. So if evolution, if we were the product, whether you said God put two cells on a rock and walked away and were the result of that. Or if you say God didn't do anything, God existed, but we evolved from whatever. Either way, does that put God in charge of us? No. God would have, what right would God have to do to say, well, I'm going to hold you accountable to my law. That's the same as you going to your neighbor and saying, you know, I've made up a new rule that you can't open your windows. And if you open your windows, I'm going to fine you. Well, what business do you have telling them what to do? Yes. You know, you have to look at it this way. If, if, there, wa if there was an evolution and things just evolved, then you wouldn't have the laws of science, such as gravity. That wouldn't exist. You really think about it, 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 you know, if somebody shoots out an evolutionary idea, I mean, there's the evolution within creation, 
but you don't have God is a God of order and evolution to me is chaos yes it, it's not order yes so you would, wouldn't have the laws of our body you know on we need the rest we need certain diet we need you know the, the things we need we need the sunshine we yes. need we need we need moisture we need water you know but if evolution it just doesn't make sense because how can you just happenstancely make all this work make our human body work the way it does just to talk about our human body or or the universe stay in order who holds the stars in place who holds the sun in place who keeps the earth revolving mm -hmm. so we don't spin out and and bounce and go into outer space i mean everything evolves around god and his law of order yes so if you get evolution involved there's no there's no order there's no there's no law yes bonnie well, i hope this doesn't sound like the deviation but i have a niece who ha happens to be raised an adventist uh, started believing uh, evolution and now is a homosexual and the bottom line with her is that uh, she feels as if she has no accountability to anybody except herself. And I think that's why people do believe in evolution. Well, besides the fact that if you believe in evolution, why do you have to be accountable to anybody else around you? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole, our whole society is set up about honoring the value of human life. At the, the, core of, the core of Western society is valuing human life. Well, if we're evolved, we shouldn't value human life because we're simply trying to help evolve to the next thing. And if we keep propping up things that shouldn't continue, we're hindering evolution. Care. If we evolved through evolution, why are we not evolving now? You know, why don't we see the, the monkeys in different stages of becoming human today? Well, it, uh, there was this video. There's, there's not enough time. There's not enough time for more of that discussion. Um, there's, I just keep, the thing that was so impressed on me, one of the biggest things, uh, was this video the kids had that we would watch that we got from the conference office. And it's like, you know, if you look at, if you look, if you have two dogs and they have puppies, the puppies look like the mommy and the daddy, right? And the same with our kids. You know, you, somebody walks in and you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's their daughter, that's their son. There's, there's always throwbacks, but that's all mixing. There's family resemblance in lines. They don't throw back to monkeys, yes, that's correct. And so the laws of nature currently are set up that we don't really come up with anything new. No. We don't, you know, humans have not evolved the ability to fly. We, we, we can't do that. There's nothing in us to change us because our DNA keeps saying we're going to replicate exactly what we have. And anybody who's studied science knows that most of the time if there's a evolution of the, of the uh, DNA, it usually is a failure. Amy, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Tom. You know, you were talking about uh, God putting a couple of cells together and then walking off and leaving it. Mm -hmm. You know, the Church of Rome and many churches today, theistic evolution is what they believe. I was flying down to Vegas one time and sitting next to this young lady and we got talking about God. So she was telling me how she believed in this theistic evolution that had happened over millions of years. And I said, so you believe in Christ? And she says, yeah. And I said, do you believe there'd be a resurrection? She says, yeah. I said, so will that take millions of years, too? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the whole point of, um, the, whole, the whole point of evolution, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should see me later, but there's, I can think of two. I'm sure there's a third one. Yeah, I think there's three things that all rose up in the 1800s, and one of them was evolution. And, and those were all specifically designed to distract from the 1844 message. Absolutely. And, and here we are going, 
Because if there's evolution, how can God judge us? Buck, or Amy, sorry. And then so, so I actually, I went to public college and I studied evolution. Mm-hmm. And um, Tuesday says the not so subtle deception. And when it comes to natural selection anyway, it's interesting that the foundation of um, evolution, it's not something you really hear about. And most people don't realize. So the title of Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, that's not the complete title. Mm-hmm. They like it's, long titles. It's, yeah, this was back in the day when they liked long titles. But here's the deception. It is scary, really. On the origin of the species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. So evolution as a philosophy, the foundation of it was elevating the Caucasian races. And, but you don't, science doesn't talk about that. But it's just, it's, it's a, it's a deception by Satan. Yeah. It's one of those dark history secrets yes. we like to keep in the closet. Yes. Yeah. Um, Buck, real quick. Quick, quick, quick point. Um, not only is there no accountability without creation, without the Lord, there's no value either. Mm-hmm. So you take yes. a look at, he, he creates the Sabbath because he doesn't just want to look at his creation. He wants to spend time with Adam and Eve. He values them. He loves them enough that the plan was, was thought through and laid in place before he created man for the terrible emergency. So he showed how much he loved by coming. So now if you don't have that, you have to create value from something else. Mm-hmm. And so there is self-help yes. and self-worth and self-esteem. You kind of see where the world has to get their value because no one says that they love them. They're not valued by anyone else. Yes. So, um, I, w- I wanted to say something about this na- natural selection and survival of the fittest. And th- would Sebastian. The, so it's, it's survival of the, of the most strong heart or the most strong eyeball or whatever else that's looking to hold on till it can have something to hook up to to make a body. Or, you know, this whole thing just sounds nuts. It's just nuts. You, you can't have these little parts all, all surviving till they can get together. <laughs> it's just crazy. I mean, you don't even need to go to, to, you don't need to go anywhere else to see that it's just ludicrous. Yes. Anyway. Bonnie. <clears throat> Are, are we so egotistical that we believe that we can actually, in, in, in our own infinite whatever, uh, create something that's going to take us over like uh, robots? <laughs> They're not made in God's image. <laughs> mm, yes, very good point. So, um, back to Sunday. We're going to end on Sunday. As the creator, Christ is uniquely qualified to examine the character of his creatures and execute justice on the wicked because Christ is our creator, right? Which um, we talked about, we read all those verses um, establishing creation and the Sabbath, going through the Bible, talking about all the different places where Sabbath is kept. And those are so specifically prescriptive, shall we say. They, they tell us exactly what to do. It just reminded me um, how if, if God is the one that created us and made us, give, gave us a plan, how dare we go and say, we're going to do something else. If, when Boeing builds an airplane, they, they write a book on all the specifications of what, how to use it, how to maintain it, the parameters in which you can fly it. What, there was a story one time 
I forget which airplane it was, and this was probably in the 70s, and they were having trouble promoting the airplane, so they, they hired a particular test pilot, and he knew the, the parameters. One of you airplane guys will probably know more of the details. He knew the specific parameters of the airplane and what it was capable of doing, and they were having, what is the big fair in Seattle on the water, and they bring all the boats? Seafair. At Seafair, he, fly, he was supposed to do a flyover, and he did a barrel roll with this airline jet. And apparently he immediately was fired, fired. He was compensated well for his stunt. And the airplane sold like hotcakes because he knew what the specifications could do. And he knew that the airplane could tolerate doing that. And it worked. It was a publicity stunt. It worked. Everybody was like, wow, look at that. Yeah, we want to fly on that one. If it can do that, why, why would you not want to fly on that one? And so God's given us this specific instruction. And so then the Bible. And so back to the book of Daniel. What does it say about the little horn? Okay, say it to the mic. Well, think to change times and laws. Yes, and speak what things? I speak blasphemous. Great things. Great things, which is blasphemous, right? Because you have God who made us, who wrote down, who gave us a, a user's manual, and then this mouth comes along and says, yeah, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to create a different day, and we're going to set that day as holy. Doesn't that just blow you away? If you really stop and think about it, that's just, really, it's crazy. That... It's blasphemous. Um, which, a uh, quick point, somebody was saying um, in, uh, during the Exodus, when the children of Israel made the molten calf and set it up, what did they call it? This is the God. They called it Lord, with a capital L. So they were misnaming what this thing actually was, which was, became blasphemy, right? I'm sorry? An idol. Yes, it was an idol, but they were calling it Jehovah, basically. And it was not. And so, can we call something, something different, and not have that be blasphemous? I don't, I don't believe so. Um... Let's see, I've gotten straight from my notes. Um, how about Exodus 31, 13, and then somebody else do Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Who has Exodus 31, 13? Raise your hand. Oh, sorry, Jean, Amy raised her hand. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So I have a question. If we aren't keeping the Sabbath, are we not being sanctified? Mm, that is a good question. Who had Ezekiel 20, verse 12? Juanita? Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctified them sanctifies them. So in the first verse in Exodus, we're looking which way? We're looking forward. And in Ezekiel, which way are we looking? We're looking backwards. But by looking backwards, we're also looking forwards because he's saying, remember back there, 
I said, I gave you my Sabbath for you to keep because I sanctify you. Now, if we want to be sanctified, I'd highly suggest that keeping the Sabbath is part of being sanctified. If it was for the children of Israel, the children of Israel were given the tabernacle service, which reflected Jesus' coming. And so all of that continues to run as a thread through the Bible. In conclusion, um, there's the paragraph two on Friday. And um, it says, within the Decalogue, the Sabbath commandment stands as its seal in that it identifies who God is, the creator, confirms the territory over which he rules, everything he created, and reveals his right to rule. So it refers back to that thing that evangelists always like to talk about when they preach about the Sabbath, which is the seal of God. It says who he is, he's the Lord God creator. It says where he rules, where does he rule? Heaven and earth, right? We always say earth because we know that, and we use heaven as what? A collection of everywhere except for here, right? Okay, help me out. I lost my train of thought. Uh, who he is, where he rules, and what else? What he did, right? He, his right to rule. He's the creator. For he created everything. In order for the dragon to succeed, referring to the devil, he had to somehow set aside this memorial, which is what, why we see the attack on the Sabbath, is it's a memorial of creation. And so by trying to get rid of that, we will then be getting rid of uh, the rest of God's stuff. Lloyd, really, really quick, do we have the mic for Lloyd, or do we put him away? Another big reason why we worship God is because of his condensation. I use that word purposely mm -hmm. to become a man who could not fill all space anymore, mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That was another point that, that I had forgotten about, which was God created us. He set aside something for us, and then he came and lived as one of us. So I would say, how dare we try to do anything other than exactly what he said. Gene, uh, I apologize, but I think we need to pray and go for our uh, service. So let's all bow our heads and pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this uh, service that we've been able to have the study of your word where we've We've perused from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, and we see this beautiful thread of creation and your rulership and your uh, right to require loyalty from us. And Lord, we um, give you our loyalty. We surrender our hearts to you today. Please remind us to, uh, if our thoughts stray from the Sabbath today, and thank you that we have the freedom to gather together to worship you on this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, please be with us throughout the rest of our church service. Thank you for those that were here, and thank you for those who are online watching, and may all of us be blessed together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for your participation.